Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome. I am so excited to have Patty Block here with us today. Patty established her company in 2006 to bring a unique perspective to the complex issues that confront women business owners, helping them grow and scale their companies. It is her mission to turn roadblocks into building blocks, empowering other women. Patty raised three fantastic kids, all of whom have launched their careers and also work in Patty's company. She essentially raised her own workforce. Clients often refer to Patty as their business therapist and secret weapon. By establishing long term relationships and serving as a strategic sounding board, clients experience direct benefits to create real and lasting change. And for full disclosure, I will tell you that I personally work with Patty, have worked with Patty. I've taken some of Patty's training and I too agree with her clients that she is a secret weapon. Welcome, Patty. Thanks, Kathy. I'm glad to be here. So Patty, let's start off by having you tell a little bit about your journey. How did you get started with your company? So this is the second company that I've owned. And the first focused on political consulting and lobbying. And I loved it. It was fascinating and I'd never do it again. And I'm so glad I don't live in that world anymore. <laughs> but chances, chances are I would still be doing political consulting today, except that I had a surprise divorce. I was 34 years old and I had three little kids. And what my frustration was in my business was if there was someone to help me grow and scale my company, figure out difficult issues, I didn't know how to find them and I didn't know who to trust. And that became part of my mission is I wanted to be that resource for other women business owners, in particular because we as women are always juggling a million things and we have a very complex marriage, so to speak, of both our personal and our business lives. So because of that, I've dealt with a lot of the same challenges that my clients have. And so I bring that perspective and I bring those shortcuts and techniques and strategies. So that was a big motivator for me. I was really um, not only sad, but I, I really grieved over closing my company. But I also knew that I needed to stabilize things for my family, that I was going to be on my own. And my youngest wasn't even two years old then. So the trade-off, so a lot of my revenue was tied to the election cycle. And the trade-off mm -hmm. for evening out my revenue was adding the lobbying, which was, it did what I wanted it to do, but then I had to travel. So I realized I needed to stop traveling, be home, stabilize things for the kids and have health insurance and all of those logistical things that you have to have that I knew I was on my own. So because of that, I ended up taking a position at an international school as director of development and then I became director of operations. So I'd had my company for about eight years then I worked at the international school for about eight years. And then I took that leap of faith in 2006 and started the block group. And the whole time I was at the international school, I was planning this company and I acquired a second motivation. So the first was to be that resource for other women business owners. The second was take my experience and expertise in finance and operations and bring that to the small business market. So that's how I founded my company, why I did it. I'm based in Houston, Texas. 
So I primarily accepted clients in Houston, Austin, and Dallas, still requiring some travel, but at least I could drive. And I could do day trips, which is really what I did. So I would the reason I waited as long as I did to start this company was to allow my kids to get a little older and more independent. Now, no one told me that your kids need you even more when they're in high school than they do when they're <laughs> toddlers. It never ends, Patty. It never ends. But I will say that because my kids were more independent, I was able to navigate that transition to leaving my position and going into or back into owning a business, which was always my intent. I love the way you plan so long-term. Is that something that you think is just part of your personality or is it something that you've learned is important? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. And I think it's both. I do think I've always been a planner and I tend to think in process. So I'm, I have an unusual combination and I didn't think it was unusual to begin with. I thought, well, everybody thinks like this. But as I've gotten further in my career, I've realized very few people can see the big picture and really strategize around that and then make stuff happen that they can do both. Usually you can do one or the other. And so I feel very fortunate that I can do both. And I spend a lot of time helping my clients not only strategize, but take those ideas and make them achievements and accomplish things so that they're getting closer to the direction they wanna go or to the goals that they've set. And some of that has been, I've learned to do. So in answer to your question, I think it's both. I have that in my nature and I am a planner, but I have learned how to balance that better as I've gone along and how to communicate that better. So having worked with you, I, I do know that you have a very unusual mind in a really good way. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that you are really good at processes and you also have a very scientific mind. Now, do you have a background in science? I do, actually. So uh, originally, I hoped to be an anthropologist and I studied primates. And did that for, <laughs> for years. And then I ended up raising little primates of my own. So, <laughs> so um, that is my background is in physical anthropology and forensics and working with primates. Wow. At the same time, and maybe partially related to that, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but I got very, very involved in politics and was always involved in politics growing up and then in college and volunteered and people start offering to pay me. Can I hire you to be my political consultant or to do political fundraising or to do events or to lobby or, and so that's really how I built my business was working from home, people who offered to pay me and I knew nothing about pricing I knew nothing about sales. I knew nothing about how to make my business grow. And that's where I really felt frustrated. And as I said, is what created the conditions for me to want to be that resource for other women business owners. Yeah. So because you knew of your own struggle in how to price and how to sell, you now help others do that and other things, but those are two of your big focuses. Yes, it is. And the reason for that is because after all these years of helping women business owners across the country, there are commonalities, there are trends that I see. And one of those is that as women, we undervalue ourselves and we consistently underprice our services. 
And pricing is the linchpin for everything else. So if your pricing is not appropriate, if it isn't doing what you need it to do, then you can't reinvest in your company. You can't take money out of your company. You can't hire people. You can't do all of these things that would allow you to expand and grow. So there are two reasons that I really love helping women improve their pricing. One is for that reason, because then once you have that foundational piece, there's so much else you can build on, on top of that. But the second reason is, because in my experience, when women earn more, we share that wealth. We spread that good fortune and that generosity with our families, with our staff, with our community. There are so many positives that come out of women earning more. And those are, just like I had two motivators to start this company, those are my motivators now, that I want to reach a broader audience of women because it's such a pervasive problem. And I have all of these very unique tools to help fix your pricing, help you think of it in a different way, shift your mindset around money, around pricing, and then build a pricing model that is not only better for you financially, it's also better for your clients because if you can hire people, if you can provide your service in a robust way, then you're impacting your clients in a more robust way. So there are so many positives that come from that. And those motivators now are so exciting for me. And I recently have developed a concept called the Revenue Roundtable. And that came from feedback that I kept getting about, well, we really love what you're teaching us and it's obviously changing our company and we're really excited about that. And we'd love to be talking to other women business owners who are going through those same transformations. So the Revenue Roundtable is designed for women business owners, typically two to 10 years in business that own service companies. And they are coming together as a peer group that I facilitate and share my teaching and knowledge, not only about pricing, but all the methods you can use to build revenue for your company. And so we keep a small community. There's no more than 15 people at each table and everyone gets to know each other. They can cross refer, they can help each other. So it's a very collaborative experience and I'm, so gratified by the feedback that I get from that. So yes, yeah, so I teach about how to fix your pricing, how to, how to treat sales more like matchmaking. So sell doesn't feel like a four letter word, how to develop your strategy muscles, how to um, deal with your employees differently, how to shift your mindset, all the things that women are struggling with. And I know because I've struggled with them. And now putting those experiences and expertise to work for other women. Um, and I haven't shared this with you yet uh, because I just actually did it, but I, you know, you know, I took your course. What's the name of the program that I took? Value Driven Pricing. Value Driven Pricing. And Patty gave a tool. What's the name of the, that tool that I love that I'm, that I used the for scoping. Yes. It's a template that you can use to scope work so that you can fig, fit that into a pricing model. You decide what model works for you. And I share all that information mm -hmm. and then it's almost like a plug and play and you can mm -hmm. start plugging in to your pricing model once you've scoped a particular project or a, in my case, a revenue roundtable or a program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I had done that during your program um, with your assistance for my high level program. And about two weeks ago, I started using it again because I knew I needed to modify my low price program. And I used all of your tools, wrote everything out, put all those numbers in. I was able to figure out where was my break even and where was I going to be making money? What my, you know, built-in permanent costs are, what the, co the costs are, what my profit margin was going to be. I wrote all of it out, put it all in writing. And then I one by one shared it with my team members that needed to buy in. Instead of in the past, I would just go, hey, I have this idea. How about blah, 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 blah. And they'd ask me a million questions. And one by one, I shared this model with them. And each one of them was like, who are you? Where's the other Kathy? <laughs> you really did this work? I'm like, yes, I learned how to do this from Patty Block. And um, I had to get five people buy in and they had suggestions as we went through that made it even better. And now my team is excited about it. They're all working together and we know our goal. We know what our outcome is going to be. And Patty, I just want to thank you for that because it was, I mean, literally, such a different way for me to approach things. And my team is incredibly grateful. That is wonderful. That's wonderful. And it also speaks to the power of collaboration. And I think as women, we underestimate, first of all, how powerful we are as individuals. That's also why we underprice. But we also underestimate the spark that we can achieve when we collaborate. And I have people who ask me about competitors and how do I differentiate and how do I deal with competitors? And my standard advice is find a way to collaborate. Competitors don't have to be adversarial and there's so much opportunity. So see if there's a way you can collaborate. And in fact, in the revenue roundtable, I decided not to have one seat her industry. And that was something I considered at the beginning, but ended up deciding not to do that for exactly this reason. And mm -hmm. as I talk to people that have already, they're already in the round table and they're, uh, I got feedback from them and said, how do you feel about this? To a person, every one of them said, I'm excited to meet these other people yeah. in my industry. And I'm sure we can find ways to collaborate. Right. Yeah. So Absolutely. congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. I can't even tell you. I was just like, oh, this works so much better than the way I was doing it before, which was just like, hey, I got an idea. Let me just share it with everybody. And then they all go, what? Ask a million questions, feel insecure about it. And this way they all saw the numbers, saw the idea in writing, well laid out the way you had recommended. And every one of them was excited rather than I would tell you in the past when I've done things like this um, in my old way of doing it, they were not excited about it. They were overwhelmed by it because they didn't really see, see it in black and white. Like it is when I use your system and your tools. So thank you so much for creating that because my mind is not scientific and my mind doesn't work the way yours does, but the way you teach and demonstrate this, it's easy to understand and implement. In Wonderful. fact, it's a lot Thank easier you. than the way I was doing it, quite honestly. <laughs> well, and you can see how powerful it is. Oh, my God. That, yeah. right, you went through the whole process and you got such a great result. And I'm just thrilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly how many I have to sell to break even. And then how many, um, you know, I am uh, forecasting that I will sell. And, um, it's exciting because we can all see what's going to happen and we can easily then compare what actually happens and go back and modify as needed. So um, before I didn't have any of this stuff in place, I always said I accidentally made money. I'm not accidentally doing it anymore. I'm on purpose doing it. <laughs> I'm strategizing. You're teaching me how to do this and I love it. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so let's see. I wanted to go back to one other thing that you talked about which is that women undervalue themselves, underprice. 
Why do you think that is? Any thoughts on why? I think there are several things that play into that. One is how we're raised in Western culture. And depending on our family of origin and what we were taught to believe or what might have been communicated to us, maybe not in words, but we understood certain things. And so I think that plays into that there may not have been as much expected of us. I know that was true in my family. There was a lot more expected of my brothers than of me. And I kind of rebelled against that. And I was the first kid in the family to get an advanced degree. And I was, um, I was very, was and, and I am very driven and very ambitious. And so, the upside or maybe the silver lining of those negative messages for me was that it created a situation where I'm very driven. The downside is we have a lot of self-doubt and a lot of, we question our self-worth more, much more so than the guys do. The guys really take an approach of I'll fake it till I make it. And I'm not going to worry about credentials. They really not, do. They really do. And they don't even worry about faking it. They don't have the imposter syndrome like women do, I don't think either. Well, I think there's an expectation of themselves. They expect they're going to be, go out and do something. And they're more willing to take risks than most women. And so they're mm, already positioned. Yes to do certain things. And as women, we are not necessarily positioned for those things. And we don't have the same expectations of ourselves. So there's self-doubt, we question, we do what I call mental gymnastics, which is completely exhausting. And it's something that I teach is, if you can channel that energy from all the head trash and all of the mental gymnastics that you're doing, like, trying to figure out if this is really a good buyer for you and why they're not going to buy from you. That is actually an exercise that we go through when we're in the sales process, whether we're aware of it or not. And if you can channel that energy in a more positive way, first of all, you're more likely to bring in ideal buyers. You're more likely to have successful sales experiences and you're more likely to be working with people that you love to work with. At the same time, when you address pricing, then you're being compensated appropriately. And that speaks to your worth as well. So it's very interconnected in terms of, of what's in our way as women. And in my opinion, most of it is in our own heads. It's now there's very little that is keeping women business owners from succeeding in terms of outside forces. And, but there are tons of inside forces in our heads that are in our way and what I consider roadblocks. And it's something I talk about frequently that you can turn those roadblocks into building blocks. And that is really very much what I teach. And it's the basis for the Revenue Roundtable. And it's surprising to me when I work with business owners that have been in business 20 or 25 years, but they're still struggling with the same roadblocks and the same mindset that they had when they started their companies. And that's very limiting. Wow, that would be very limiting. I mean, I still have challenges and roadblocks, but they are different um, because what I see, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, is as my business continues to grow, I have different challenges and different roadblocks and different self-doubt. Yes. Do you find that? Absolutely. And it kind of depends on the stage in your business life cycle. So the two to 10 years in business, so startups are in a breed by themselves, right? If you're less than two years in business, you have startup issues, as does every startup, regardless of the gender of the owner. 
there, it's just a very challenging time the first two years. Mm -hmm. The two to 10 years, people are starting to really get in the groove, right? Both male and female. They're mm -hmm. understanding more about their clients and their buyers. They're, they're putting together how they wanna deliver the service in the highest quality way. They're doing a lot of networking. So that is one phase. By the time you get to the 10 year mark, for me, I was looking for a new challenge. When I hit the 10 year mark, I thought, you know, my kids are grown. They're in the process of launching their own careers. That takes less of my time. And, and two of my kids own businesses. And as you mentioned, they all three also contribute and work inside my business. And I could refocus my energies. And what I decided to do at the 10 year mark was to expand nationwide. So I went completely virtual first and then started developing business in particular cities. And that has been a huge game changer for my business. And I've loved doing that. It's, I think it's one of the best business decisions I've ever made. And part of that is meeting fabulous people. In fact, Kathy, that's how I met you is through that expansion. <laughs> so, yeah. And you are one of the best networkers. I know you're amazing, Patty. You, you, you have, you are very, very good at networking. Thank you. I, I think you really connecting. care about people. I think I you do. really care about people and it shows. Thank you. I care a great deal and I love connecting people because then, you know, going back to that idea of the spark, there's a spark when you connect people who then like they'll email me and say, that was such an incredible connection. How did you know that we were going to click like that? And some of that I think is intuitive that I do. I pay a lot of attention. So I love connecting people. And so going back to the life cycle issue at the 10 year mark, often people are ready for a new challenge. So they want to innovate. They want to do things differently. Then you hit about the 20 year mark. And you said this to me a few weeks ago, which I just thought was brilliant. You don't want me to teach you things as much as you want me to teach you to stop doing things. Right? Yes. That when yeah. you hit. I when want my CEO time, not more to do's. Exactly. And that is a different phase in your life cycle from the standpoint of how you, what you want to do with your business, how you want it to grow and what you want the future to look like. And it's a very different vantage point than if you were 10 years in business. So mm -hmm. I deal with women in all different phases and uh, the last phase, which is when they're looking to exit their companies. And I'm helping them position their companies either for sale or to pass on to the next generation or perhaps to their employees. So I do a lot of work with women that are, they, they care about their legacy and they want to mm -hmm. exit their company, but they want to realize the benefits of, you know, and have financial gain from that. They also want to leave a legacy. And so that's very gratifying work for me as well. So others, I, I don't really work with startups, but that mm -hmm. two to let's say 30 or 35 years in business, mm -hmm. I work with people in all those stages. And for me, that's really great because there's a lot of variety, but I can bring so much to each phase and, and know what they need. Um, people often know what they want, but they don't know what they need. So if I can help clarify that for them and bring things to their attention that maybe they're not aware of, I, sometimes I talk about that I can help identify problems before you even know their problems. And the huge benefit of that is we can address those before we have to focus on damage control. And if we can mm, do that on the front end, point. yeah, if we can do that on the front end, that is going to save them a lot of time, energy, money, and heartache. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you just, you have just blown me away again, because you do understand this so incredibly well. And, you know, I feel like there are a lot of people who 
are on one extreme or the other, at least that I've talked with when it comes to their business. There are p- people who get into business and immediately know I'm going to build this to sell it as fast as I can for a profit. And then there are people who get into it because they love what they do. They want to create the business and they don't really think about the exit. That was me because, you know, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to build a great business. I thought I could, but I wasn't sure. And so I didn't build it to sell it from the beginning. And now I'm looking at that going, oh, now I need to start learning what to do to make sure that it's set up to sell it if I choose to. Do you see that or how do you, what do you, what are you seeing in how people do this, their thought process on this? Yes. So a lot of people start their businesses as lifestyle businesses. So, That's what I did. Right. They're not really creating a job for themselves because it is their company and they are building value, but mm-hmm. they're not thinking about exit. They're mm-hmm. thinking about how can I generate revenue so that I have money I can take out of my company. I can pay myself. I can pay my staff. A lot of the women that I work with take a lot of pride in providing jobs. Oh, and I do too. Yes. And so that is, um, it's very important. So I'll give you an example. When I ask for feedback from some of my clients, if you had an extra $100,000 in your business, what would you do with it? And at first, they're very surprised by the question. And then they say, oh, I'd give my staff a raise, or I'd plan an annual retreat for my staff, or I'd hire more people. Or it's, that is always their answer. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about that generosity. It's about providing jobs. It's about building a team. It's about collaboration. And that is a great example of what I was describing earlier when I said, when women earn more, we share Mm -hmm. the wealth. And that's how we do it is we, Mm -hmm. we want to empower and build our teams not only so they can help us and it continues that cycle of building our business, but because we know we're helping others and providing jobs is a fabulous way to do that. So, Mm -hmm. so that is, um, I think it's very important for women in particular because we're very heart centered and Mm -hmm. I don't consider myself a sentimental person. And sometimes my family teases me about that, but I care very deeply about everyone I'm connected with, of course, starting with my clients and I'm very involved with my extended family and my kids and, and those relationships and that level of collaboration, that's what makes my world go round. Um. Oh, so one of these times we're going to have to talk about how your family teases you because I feel your heart, Patty. And if, if those of you listening to this, comment, let us know. Are you feeling Patty's heart? Because I feel it. And I, I think you're, uh, I don't know if the word's sentimental, but you've got a huge heart and it shows. So thank you for being so amazing, helping others. So I have one more thing, um, one more question for you. I want to go back to when you were talking about you had your first company um, in politics and lobbying, and then you uh, took a job for that stability for your children so you didn't have to travel as much. And the whole time you were planning this company that you have now, the Black Group. As you went through those different processes or uh, the different jobs, the different careers, you started a company, ended that company, then you went to a corporation, then you started another company. Uh, That's daring, that's courageous. So how did you have the courage to take those next step each time? Well, thank you for the compliment. I, I won't dispute that it was courageous, but I didn't think that at the time. The way I looked at it is, so when I was much younger in my twenties and very naive, I thought <laughs> I thought that your career would be a straight line, right? Because I'm a linear thinker and I thought, well, this is 
my path and this is my career. And so it'll just be a straight line. And of course, as you get older, you realize no one's career is a straight line. And life happens and life happened to me. And if you had told me when I was in my 20s that I'd be 35, divorced with three kids, I would never have believed you, never. I mean, that just wasn't in my plan, right? So right. life happens. I don't think it's in anybody's plan to do that, but it happens to many, many, many people. Exactly, which is another way that I can help other women, whether they are in a marriage, whether they're out of a marriage, whether they're a widow, whether they, that, that life happens kind of thing. Um, part of what I bring to the people I work with is my resilience, my adaptability, my learning to cope and learning strategies to cope. And I can share that with the women that I work with. And it's one of the the strengths that I bring to those relationships. But the other thing that I think is really important is not to think of every turn in the road as starting over. Because, and I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel as though, oh my goodness, what am I going to do now? I'm lost. I'd never felt that way. I felt like I have to make a decision. I have to make a choice. And my choice is really important. Where do I want to get in the long term? And this is where being a planner really worked to my advantage because I could look into the future and think, where do I want to be three years, five years from now? And, and who do I want to help? Who do I want to serve? And so I got really clear on that first. So it didn't feel like it was courageous at the time, but what it did feel like is this is a very important transition and when we can harness those transitions and the, the, all the good and bad and ugly of a transition, even if it's painful, that becomes a transformation. And that is what creates the, what we often think of as a silver lining. But when I look back at my journey, yes, it was painful. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, it was challenging, all of those things. But I had to be there to get here. And here is fantastic. <laughs> so I'm very, very grateful. And yeah. if I can help others see those transitions and how they can become transformations, then I've done my job. Then I've impacted the people I want to impact in the way I want to impact them. And that is what I do with my clients. And that is what I'll be doing in the Revenue Roundtable. And we'll have the power of a safe space for peers to be helping each other. Well, Patty, thank you so much for sharing all of these golden nuggets that you've shared with us today. Um, I know there are people listening to this right now going, I need to talk with this woman. I want to be in on the revenue roundtable. What else does she have going on? Maybe I need to hire her. I need her to be my business therapist or am I secret weapon? So tell us all the different ways that people can work with you and how they can get in touch with you. Thank you. There are three main ways that you can work with me. One is private consulting and you can contact me directly and I'm going to share my email address. And it's pwblock at theblockgroup.net. And the reason I use PW instead of Patty is because I spell my name with a Y and very few people do. So they were constantly spelling it wrong. And I thought, I'm just going to eliminate that issue. And it's pwblock <laughs> at theblockgroup.net. So you can also go to my website and the, at theblockgroup.net. Be sure the is in there. And um, there's a form that you can complete to contact me. And I read every form that comes in and I respond directly and I'd be happy to visit with you. The other way that we can work together is in the revenue roundtable. If you would like to apply for that, again, contact me and I'll share all that information with you. And the third way 
is that I have quite a few different programs. Two that I've mentioned today are value-driven pricing and painless selling to ideal buyers. And those two programs, you can um, subscribe to the programs and they include group coaching sessions. So then you can learn how to apply the concepts inside your business. Because my very strong belief is that just learning things is not enough. We have to be able to apply them inside our businesses. And I'm all about that. How do you make things happen? And so that's how you can reach out to me. And I'd love to hear from you. And we'll include uh, the links in the email in our show notes. Patty, thank you so much for being here with me today. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed every minute. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.